Hi students, today what we're going to talk about is the changes in Greek warfare during the 4th century. The questions that you need to answer at the end of this lecture is identifying the similarities and differences between the 4th and 5th centuries, the major individuals and their contributions, and the impact that the changes had. Reviewing what happens during the 5th century, we know that the way in which Greek warfare is fought is using the phalanx system. This consists of traditionally eight deep rows of men in which they pretty much push against one another and the lines behind them okay, are using their spears to try to thrust at the enemy. Um, however, during the 5th century and during the Peloponnesian War, we already see some armies beginning to use deeper um, rows of men, which is kind of going to become a sort of a key theme in the changes that happened in the 4th century. Battles during the Peloponnesian War became much larger, um, and the phalanx system during the 5th century still relies on the system whereby a uh, man's shield at the front of the phalanx protects both himself and the man to his left. This ends up um, meaning that the right is unprotected, and that's where the sort of the best troops um, form on the right side, okay, it's kind of an honor to be uh, fighting on the right side, it means that you're the best the best troops. So what happens, as you can see from the diagram here, is that traditionally the right, okay, will always kind of outflank, um, and this will mean that the, the phalanx shifts, and until the two sort of, you know, best soldiers sort of meet, um, and normally whoever the best soldiers are on that right side, um, end up being the victors. We see this really clearly in the Battle of Mantinea in 418. This is during the 5th century, during the Peloponnesian War, um, in which King Aegis uh, recognizes the um, strength of the right side and the way in which they can be used to outflank the enemy. Um, and he is able to be victorious against the Athenian um, Athenians and their allies by putting his strongest troops on the right, outflanking the enemy, um, and he pretty much crushes them. It's like one of the largest uh, victories for the Spartans during the Peloponnesian War. Uh, so during the 4th century, we have a lot of different experimentation. We have people like the Spartans changing their tactics, uh, the Thebans who have got different types of tactics, again, with the Sacred Band, um, and then obviously leading up into Macedon and Philip and his huge military reforms. Um, the phalanx during the 5th century is slow. It is a very, very slow way of attacking the enemy. Um, traditionally, cavalry is not really used because of the unground, the uneven ground. Um, in Greece, you've got lots of mountains, lots of ridges. So phalanx is pretty much the only way, seem to be the only way of fighting. Um, however, during the 4th the century, we see this importance of cavalry, cavalry really being sort of reaffirmed. And that's really important when we look at Macedon and the companion cavalry. Um, mercenaries play a really important role and the idea of a, the professionalization of the army becomes really important. Training of troops um, during the 5th century, mostly non-existent. Um, the only professional army that um, is in Greece during this period of time is the Spartans and they have this aura or this prestige of invincibility um, because they are professional soldiers. Um, Battle tactics become more complex, um, and we have generals like Epaminondas and Philip um, becoming sort of leading um, generals at the time who begin to rapidly change the way in which you know battles are fought. Um, so the presentation will cover kind of the first part of the changes in Greek warfare, but the Macedonian reforms are going to be alluded to as I you know kind of talk about them. But we're going to talk about them more when we get to Macedon itself. So as I said before, there's the 5th century phalanx is made up of soldiers who volunteer. Okay, they're not trained at all. Okay, they have to um, they are have to get their own equipment. Okay, there's no real professional army. The Theban experience under the occupation, um, under Spartan occupation, exposed them to the ways that Spartan had apparently when they wrestled the gymnasium and they found out they were just as strong. Um, so this is during when Phoebidas takes control of the Chemdea in Thebes, and they realize, you know, we can be just as strong as them. After liberation of Thebes, um, uh, Gorgodas, Pelopidas, and Epomamandas um, set about training the Thebans in the same phalanx warfare, and we have that shift to professionalization of um, the army. And obviously, 
important battles, okay, that we're going to look at, like Luctra, spurred them on to realize that Spartans were only better warriors because they practiced. Um, so we have the rise of this elite infantry. The um, inspired, this is inspired by the Spartan Hippes, uh, who do exist prior to the 400, um, and they are professional troops. Um, another example of elite troops is the Theban Sacred Band, which is made up of 150 um, pairs of lovers, the Spartan Royal Guard, the Macedonian um, Hippastes, and the Arcadian League um, Epikiotai. The Peltas, we've already looked at them during the Corinthian War, but because of the slowness of the phalanx, we realized that you know, light armor troops that can be mobile on the battlefield potentially could be um, of a benefit in the battle. Again, phalanx very slow, Peltas lightly armored um, and more agile. The Thracians, okay, were specialists in this and were often, often um, hired as mercenaries. And we really see this in the Battle of Lycaeum during the Corinthian War in which the Athenian general Epicrates begins to experiment, um, making some changes and uses them really effectively in defeating the Spartan um, phalanx. So what does he do? He equips them with um, spears um, and they pretty much become sort of a shock troop which they throw spears at the enemy um, looking to, to scatter the, the, the hoplite, the phalanx forces. Once the hoplites charge, okay, they then retreat because they're more maneuverable and more agile and obviously have, don't have the um, heavy armor weighing them down. They're able to retreat faster. The um, phalanx loses its shape and then they can continue to attack. This is really, really effective. Um, he used very large shields, short spears, and little swords, um, and in order so that soldiers might move and charge more easily when less burdened. Um, and he just gives them very basic armor, um, just a breastplate and a short sword if they get into close combat. Um, but you know, he really makes them um, very move, you know, maneuverable on the battlefield. Again, we see this okay in Lycaeum where we have um, the Peltas, okay, and the Spartan Moray uh, returning to Lycaeum. The Peltas attack and then they retreat, okay, forcing the uh, phalanx to lose its shape um, again, and um, they have defeated in that battle during the Corinthian War. Um, so we've got. Xenophon here, which discusses that each time orders were given to the attendant shield bearers to pick up the men and bear them to the right, bear them into the game. These indeed were the only members of the Mora who were, strictly speaking, saved. The Pomarch ordered 10 years of servicemen to charge and drive off the assailants. Charge whoever they might, they took nothing um, by their pains. No man they could come at with within javelin range. Being heavy infantry opposed to light troops, before they could get close quarters, the enemy's word of command shall retire. Whilst as soon as the own ranks fell back, scattered as they were in consequence of a charge where each man's individual speed had toll, Epicrates and his men turned right about and renewed the javelin attack while others running alongside harassed their exposed flank. So we see flanking being utilized. We see the uh, maneuverability of troops and the agileness of troops and the peltash really, really effective. Um, and you can see the death toll, including those who fell in the second fight and the final fight must have numbered 250 slain or thereabouts. Um, and you really, you know, we, this is the first, one of the first times in which we really see the, the Spartan phalanx being able to be defeated. As mentioned before, mercenaries become very, very important. Um, and as I said um, previously, the majority, the 4th century, 5th century armies are made up of citizens, okay? They're citizen armies. They're not um, professional soldiers. However, mercenaries, expensive, um, not necessarily very loyal perhaps, obviously go to the highest bidder, um, but they are very well-trained soldiers and experienced on the battlefield. Pelopidas' mercenary force turned against them, okay, however, when Alexander Ferry offered to double their pay. So we see this and Macedon uses this very effective later on. Philip is able to be successful and hire lots of mercenaries because he can pay them more than anyone else. You know, he increases pay to the point where mercenaries go to him, of course. Xenophon Fonon himself was a mercenary during his lifetime. He served in the Cyrus of Persia. Um, Thebes occasionally rented out hoplites to Persia for campaigns, um, and this gave them much needed re revenue. Um, we see that where um, Artaxerxes has to um, control, we control elements of his, of his empire. So tactics, 
as I mentioned before, the first battle of Maintenance, we see that the top troops are placed on, on the right of each um, phalanx because that is where the strongest. However, what Epomamandas does at Lutra is he puts the Theban sacred band um, against the Spartanites, against the, the top troops of the Spartan allied forces. And he makes them 50 deep as opposed to the usual kind of eight or 12. So he deepens the lines, okay, gives them extra reserves and extra troops, and he puts his best troops on the left. Um, that is the sacred band. Um, and he, what is called an, an oblique attack. So you can see here, um, the Theban sacred band attacks very, very quickly. Okay, looking to outflank the enemy and then at a very slow pace, the other, the other um, units attack. Um, but all the time, okay, the Sacred Band crushes the Spartans and they can come around and flank and ultimately the Spartans flee and they're able to um, be successful. Philip and Alexander uh, were best known for their reliance on cavalry and using to exploit gaps in the enemy line that was created by a phalanx moving on angles. And that's become important when we look at later battles that um, both of them fight. Um, Earlier in the, in the 4th century, we don't see cavalry charges being that effective but you can see how the you know maneuverability with the peltas you can see the way in which we uh, put troops on different sides and the, uh, the um the idea of flanking the phalanx is kind of the key way of destroying it because they're not um protected from the sides so what you'll need to do and how you'll need to answer these questions in the hsc um some questions in the past have looked at the, the changes in greek warfare to what extent do they change um, what does evidence suggest about changes in Greek warfare? And you need to analyze the changes in Greek war warfare during this period. So hopefully that gives you a good overview of everything that we need to know so you can go ahead and do your essay plan on these questions. Thank you.